Although many, many of us uh, use our common sense and knowledge to deter which websites are providing truthful, knowledgeable information and which websites are providing false information, what other tactics do you suggest individuals such as myself and my fellow classmates use to help us deter from the hundreds of articles we are exposed to social media every day? I think it's a, a struggle that a lot of people are facing, regardless of their age or how they consume the news, especially now. Let me start, start by saying what I think fake news is. I think fake news has made its way into our lexicon over the past four to six months based on what we saw happening in the United States. But let's be very clear. Fake news has been around for a long time. But fake news is something that is... In, in many cases, something that you just don't agree with. So like often the president has said, it's fake news because I don't agree with it if it's just not real. So that's how he, I feel he has dismissed it. But there's also times when something is, and I know a question is going to come up about this, when someone has just created a story out of literally pulled something out of their ass and is saying, this is, these are statements of fact. And that's how I think a lot of stories were sort of generated and propagated throughout the course of the, uh, the last pres US presidential election. Now, how do you sort of filter through that and cut through the crap? Well, LaDrew's right. Buy a newspaper, like the Toronto Sun. Uh, you can pick up some other ones. It's fine, too. But um, there are the, the challenge we have, even in the media, and I know we will dive further into this, so I'll just touch on it briefly. We have uh, a struggle as well because we have to rely on international news agencies to get the story correct. And I have a very specific example from yesterday's terrorist attack that I'm going to use, but I won't, I won't divulge it now. Um, so we have a challenge also keeping up and with far more limited resources that we have in our newsroom daily, uh, challenges come up. But we often, we, we subscribe to wire services like AP, as, you know, as Canadian Press and things like that, uh, Reuters, and that are generally reliable. So that's how we, we, keep, it, uh, we keep it safe from, from our readers that this is, this is the, the straight goods. But how do you block that on Facebook and Twitter and when everybody with a camera, everybody with a smartphone is now, you know, a citizen journalist and can literally make up any story they want or, or put forward any story they want in any manner they feel is, is appropriate to them or the way they uh, you know, have a viewpoint on it. There's no good answer right now. I mean, that's why I think part of your question, you answered it yourself. You use your own common sense. And you know, there still remains to be many news outlets around the world that are <coughs> verified and trustworthy and not compromised. Can I just chime in there? There's, I think there, there's fake news, which, as Adrian said, came up with, uh, with Trump. And usually, fake news has a kernel of truth to it. Yeah. And then there's false news. Yeah. And Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, when he was president of the United States, was up against a campaign of false news. But in those days, people would just, you could make newspapers, and they would just print up any load of garbage about him, uh, the opposition, and send it out, looking like a newspaper. That's mm -hmm. false news. It's going to go on. It's just on social media now. And so the bottom line is your own, your own good sense, your own judgment, and, your, and, and the reliability of the source. And um, Adrian talked about it in newspapers. At CP24, we have a number of journalists and fact finders. And there's a story came up yesterday afternoon. It was false news out of the United States based on who perpetrated that evil act in London. And, they, and it, was, uh, it was, well, it's public knowledge. It was the New York Post. It was up. And it was down in about 45 minutes yep. when they did some further checking to it. Yep. So most news services um, are very reliable, and they, they, they double check and they triple check. And someone, even if this triple check, there was something a few weeks ago, it just didn't seem right to me. And I went back to the journalist and said, you know, just check this out again. And they said, well, it's on the wires. And I said, I don't care if it's on the wires. It doesn't make any sense to me. And, um, and it was wrong even though it was on the wires. So you just have to triple check. Mm -hmm. Most of, or a lot of the stuff on social media, you take it as entertainment, it's not news. As you know, the barriers to entry for journalism industry are pretty high. So my question for either of you, how would a state enforced accreditation affect the journalism industry? And would you approve or disapprove considering the additional difficulties it may impose on journalists? Like we have various 
sort of hoops that media outlets go through. Like, for example, we have press galleries. We have a Queen's Park press gallery. We have a Qu uh, City Hall press gallery. And, of course, on Parliament Hill. So they have their own professional institution that governs who actually gets a chair watching question period or gets office space and things like that. So there are already sort of self-regulatory bodies where I don't believe that the government needs to be involved in that. Because that actually, I take issue with the... The sort of and then the ultimate independence of, of your, your journalism. As someone who is very involved in the public communication industry now, what was the biggest challenge that you have faced with fake news and how did you deal with it? Well, you know, I'm in a very fortunate position to have really good editors that are sur I'm surrounded by deputy editors, city editors. Again, sadly, our, our numbers dwindle on, on a quarterly basis. But, um, you know, it's kind of like, I'm just touch on that by what Stephen talked about earlier. Sometimes things just, you just darn well know that's just BS. It's does, it doesn't, doesn't pass the proverbial smell test. So you have a pretty good sense of, of what's real, what's accurate, and what, or, or what's not. But there's, if anything, it doesn't matter what medium you're in, there's one thing we always govern ourselves by, and that's very simple. It's trust but verify. So it's, it's a simple matter of so-and-so, some Canadian was arrested in some obscure country over this charge, we'll call the Department of Foreign Affairs to confirm it because it's being reported in some tiny little newspaper that's on some obscure website, but it could be a real story, but I don't know if it is, so we have to verify that on our own. We're not afforded the opportunity all the time to do that, if, especially in a 24-hour news cycle. Um, and if you're not afforded that chance to trust or uh, to verify the information, you don't run with the story. And that sometimes might mean you miss something. So, and we miss a lot of things, uh, but that's, that's, a, that's a reality. That's a sacrifice that I think so many, of, so many editors are willing to take. Because there's one thing to be, there's, one, there's such a desire to be first these days. I want to be first. This, it's a thing we have in our, our newsrooms. Oh, first reported by X media outlet. First reported by... That's nonsense. That's only amongst me, news outlets that they gave a crap about that. There's one desire to be first, but there's also the desire to be right. I'd rather be right than first. Being called to be delivering fake news clear, clearly undermines the journalist's credibility. Mr. LeDrew, uh, in your 10 years of experience in broadcasting, was there ever a time when you doubted the news you were broadcasting? How did you deal with this, and what are your standards when it comes to reporting news that may be politically subjective? Well, to answer your first question, there have been times, and therefore I don't say it. In other words, I was, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not a journalist, first of all. I'm a lawyer, I've been a lawyer for a long time, I've been involved in politics, but I, I'm not a journalist. I have a pretty good smell test, notwithstanding. And, um, I, um, and I'm not scripted. No one writes things for me, but sometimes they give me facts, and the facts, I don't like the facts, I don't agree with the facts, and the sense there's, I think there's something wrong with it. I just, uh, I just won't go there. And I'm old enough uh, that I don't have to take any baloney from somebody who says, well, you gotta do this story. I said, well, if that's not a story, I, um, or if it's not true, or if you know, the angle that they're looking at, I don't uh, think is proper, then I don't do it. I, uh, I love taking on subjects that I think that uh, people, um, where officials have done wrong. I used to be in an elected office, and I went across the country saying, you know what, the people in Ottawa don't always have the smartest ideas or the best judgment. And it's everybody's duty to challenge it, and if you think it's, uh, if it's wrong, stand up. And that's what I like to do. So. That's a good thing to do. That's why I love being you know, around students because they generally have a good uh, sense of, of baloney. My question is, do you believe that the media's focus on sensationalism places unreasonable pressure on journalists to feel the need to partake in embedded journalism in order to serve the interests of media conglomerates? And in relation to rescuing these journalists, do you believe that the government is correct in actively refusing to pay ransom? I think they are correct. I think that uh, the cases of kidnapping and and demands for ransom will go up exponentially if governments do pay it. And so the policy is right. And the practicality is that some governments do pay it, depending on the circumstances. And uh, they'll deny it. Mm -hmm. We've had some in Canada. And I think that, you know, even though it's a lie, I think it's the right policy. Because you don't know either the intelligence or the knowledge of the, of the kidnappers who are holding it. So that's the right policy. 
to say, you know, we don't do that. And then either send in James Bond or send in, you know, some, uh, some, some spies and sometimes money changes hands. But I think that, um, you know, I think that by and large, it's a good policy. As far as sending in journalists, it reminds me, I was reading, uh, rereading uh, The Last Lion, which is, on William, uh, which is on Churchill by Manchester, at the start of World War II. And there was fake news. And it was uh, the British, the BBC was run by a guy who was, was completely under the Prime Minister's thumb. He wouldn't allow real stories to come out. And people had no idea what was going on in Poland, in Czechoslovakia. I mean, they, they, there was people being mowed down, and nobody in England knew about it except for the government. And this guy running the BBC wouldn't allow any stories out because it would hurt Chamberlain. And so I think it's important that there's journalists that would go out there. What happened in, in England is that there were some journalists that went over there and they're telling these stories back and they went back to the States and then the States sent the stories to Britain. And that's how you mobilize people against atrocities. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the good things about news and about uh, journalists. So I don't think if someone says, listen, I have a, a journalist says, I have a, uh, a husband or a wife and children, I can't go and take that risk. I would respect that. But on the other hand, if you're... Um, if you're like a Hemingway and you're 23 years old and you want to go to the war front and uh, make your name, well, so be it. You take the chances. Mm -hmm. I actually uh, agree with all of that. Uh, I would only add that um, we, have, we have to rely on so many of them that are prepared to put themselves in harm way to actually provide us with the story, provide us with that first-hand account what's actually happening on the ground because so very often... And just touching on what um, Stephen just said with respect to propaganda from a government, um, that is often filtered out from certain parts of the world. So unless Western journalists, for example, are the ones that are able to um, sort of cut through that, you're not going to be provided with the real sort of either humanitarian effort that needs to be um, you know, helped with or... Uh, even with the United Nations going on the ground or whatever sort of you know, third-party organization that's going to try to help, um, without that ability of journalists to be able to tell the story, we're, we're really going to miss a lot. And you know, if, if I had a reporter or a columnist that says, look, I want to go to Syria, and I want to report from the front line, or I want to be embedded with you know, a special forces oper operation or whatever the case may be, I, I mean, A, I'd have to find the money to pay for them to go, but I, I would be happy. I would not be happy to send them, but I would be comfortable sending them. Um, because I know, that, well, they're an adult, for one thing. They know the risks. They know the challenges. Um, but I also know that it would be a pretty extraordinary experience to be able to tell that story from the front, front lines. Do you think Canada f faces any threats by its response to President Trump's ban by allowing Muslims to enter uh, Canada without a similar screening process, and if you do, what such, or do you have any suggestions on how we can prove our current... No one has a right to go to another country, to the host country. You have no right to go to the United States. No one has a right to come to Canada. Um, and so that's what the refugee policy is all about. And Canadians are very generous in it. And that's why you have the Refugee Appeal Board, and you come here, and you get here, and you, and you make your case. So uh, if you have a good case, you stay. If not, you, uh, you go back. Uh, there, as far as screening, and I, I, this came up yesterday when uh, people were speculating in London and Canada about the perpetrator, as I said earlier, about that evil act in London and whether he was Muslim or not. And it, it, I, I would love to change the public usage of words as to whether a person is Muslim or whether they are like, like, like ISIS, you know? <laughs> And really, I mean, there are, there are so many millions of people around the world and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of Canadians who are Muslim who abhor that kind of crap going on and that evil act. And I don't like it in the media. I don't like it in, in anywhere in conversation where people say, well, you know, was he a Muslim? It doesn't matter. The question is, was he you know, influenced by Islam or with ISIS, which is not... From my understanding, from my Muslim friends, they say, well, it's, that's nothing to do with being Muslim. And I think there's a wrong public debate on that. Uh, but back to your question, though, is, of uh, screening, absolutely. You know, there are a lot of really evil people around. Um, and we don't, want them, we don't want them in Canada. We simply don't want them. That, that said, the perpetrator yesterday 
was born in England. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean he's, you know, birth alone does not mean that you're a good person or a bad person, uh, but the screening can uh, be indicative of whether you're going to come and make a contribution to Canada, or whether you need to find relief from where you're coming from, or whether you're coming here to, uh, to bomb. What do you think the Liberals can do to reassert their dominance as the premier political party of Ontario? Oh dear. Thank you for the question. I think right now it is a premier political party of Ontario. It has been uh, government for the last, what, 14, 15 years, Ralph? Um, Sadly. Just like the, the Tories were before. Mm -hmm. um, it is not like the Liberal Party of Canada in the, 20, in the 20th century, which had won virtually every election, yeah. but for a little nano blurb in, now and then. It was the most successful political party in the world. Um, but the, the provincial Liberal Party is funny because the Premier is so, so likable. Many people like her. I know women who have worked for her for years, knocked on doors when she was a trustee, and they just always thought she was great. They won't vote for her this time because they feel that she's been running such a bad government. And um, I think that how could they bring it about? They could, um, they could get a new leader, and they could show that they know how to run government, but they don't have much time to do that. They've run an absolutely unresponsive, abysmal, mismanaged, incompetent government for the last uh, three years. And I think that just like in 1994, when Bob Ray was coming to the end of his five-year term, I remember he and Jerry Kaplan, who was a political, were saying, oh, we can win this, win this. And I said, no. People have already written you off. Mm -hmm. People are just going to look to see whether it's going to be the Liberals or the uh, Tories who are going to win. And campaigns count. Going into that campaign in 95, the Liberals were way ahead with, with uh, Lynn McLeod, and they lost to Mike Harris. Um, and I think that uh, for the next Wednesday, the election is in a year this June. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, unless lightning struck, they got rid of Wynn, they brought in somebody, Pupatel or somebody, who just completely knocked everybody off their socks and she brought in a new team. Anything can happen in politics. Is it likely? No. So it's going to be a toss-up between the Tories and the NDP and going into the campaign. We won't know. And probably a week before the end of the campaign, something will gel. And uh, one of those two people will be the next premier. Look, change is coming. We had it down south. When the winds of change are in the air, it's almost virtually impossible to stop that. Um, I actually have some liberal friends. I know that may shock you, but I do. And they will, they will, they'll stay home this time. They'll sit on they their may, hands. They yeah. may not feel that they can vote for either an NDP or a conservative, but they, they just won't vote. So they'll stay home, they'll sit on their hands, and that proportionately will help, help the conservatives. But just on your, specifically on your question of where the demographics are, yeah. our paper ran a poll in the 416, which is notoriously we, we refer to as the Red Fortress, right? That 416, it's an impenetrable wall of liberal support. That wall is coming down pretty darn quickly, where you see Tories and Dippers con very competitive uh, in first and potentially second place. That's unheard of. That's unprecedented. So... That is going to be a challenge for, for, for Premier Wynne to, to either shore up that support um, and we sh she'll do it by making people be afraid of Patrick Brown because that's what they always do. You know, he's scary and he's going to, you know, do bad things to your, your female rights and blah, you know, all that scary stuff that they like to say about conservatives, which are all bullshit anyway. Um, but that's what the me message will be. And that does actually have an effect. Will it be enough to swing votes to give her another government? Holy crap, I hope not, because we should all shut the lights off and but it is just possible, hand though. over our checks. But it is possible, because, though. Damn. It is possible. Anything is possible. Yeah. Sure. So my question has to do with post 9-11. Um, after 9-11, the Muslim community began taking a lot of criticism uh, from the press, mainly in the United States. Um, during this criticism, my community and our community, the Sikh community, began taking a lot of heat as well, and this led to a lot of hate crime. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, what role does the media play when presenting radicalized extremists so innocent communities and members do not get dragged in and become victims of hate crime? I'm a Sikh as well. Um, and I grew up in Saskatchewan, I can tell you, Ron, not a lot of Sikhs in <laughs> Saskatchewan when I was growing up. <laughs> uh, but a wonderful community. Um, I remember when there was a Gurdwara attack in Wisconsin and my mother was watching CNN and she was losing her mind because she was like, why are they talking about our people? And this isn't meant to be offensive to anybody. I'm just, these are her words. Why are they talking about our people as if they were Osama bin Laden? 
because our, you know, of course, Sikhs wear turbans. And every picture they ever saw about Osama bin Laden, he had a turban on. And with, I just don't think that a lot of people understand the difference, quite frankly. And I think more and more people are. And um, it frustrates me to no end when you hear about a young Sikh boy who's had his, his bug kicked off or something like that. It frustrates me. It angers me. But I just think it's a matter of um, you know, understanding that there was a difference, and there is and remains a difference. Um, but also, we, as, we in the media have a responsibility to explain that, too. But 9-11 was so saturated. All, all, every camera, every TV was so saturated with that image of him um, wearing the white turban that I just don't think that we're, and I'm not saying it's arrogance or, or ignorance or whatever. I just think it's ill-informed. They don't know the difference. And again, I think in a city like Toronto, places all across our country and in many places in the United States, the, in, the Indian community is huge and influential and successful, and they have that ability to, to help shape policy and you get involved in communities. I, I think that's what changes it. My question for you is, did you ever face any struggles at home, such as generational gaps with your parents, or any struggles outside of home being a woman of color in senior executive roles? Indian girl growing up in, in Saskatoon, I was in the army too, for God's sake. I mean, it wasn't like I she chose how to drive easy, a the easy route. <laughs> um, you know, I've been in politics, I've been in media, and I've been, uh, you know, in, in that, in, in the, in the military, which I think would all be considered predominantly male-dominated environments, and yeah, that's a reality. But you know, we're catching up. By the way, ladies, we're the 51% now. We should start acting like it. So, it's it's important to remember that I grew up at a time when opportunities were being presented, and they were not they were not in, you know in the usual right. Okay, for for any. I'm going to be very candid here about our Indian community. They wanted us to be doctors. They wanted us to be dentists. They wanted us to be lawyers, or they wanted us to marry one. You know, that's what our <laughs> parents wanted. It's true. <laughs> but then suddenly, a few of us are like, mm, no, I think I'm going to do something different. And I'm, and I'm really happy that I didn't go down that road, and I'm doing what I'm doing. Because uh, then I get to meet great people like you guys. And uh, maybe be some sort of inspiration to some of them. But as far as challenges go, I, I never faced any institutional challenge. Like, no one ever said to me, well, you can't drive a tank because you're a visible minority. It'd be more like, you're too short, you can't reach. <laughs> but um, but I, I never, I genuinely never felt I faced that. Uh, did others? Perhaps. I think one of the things, and I'm just gonna specifically for a moment talk about my experience in the Army. Um, I was a lieutenant in the army. I was a very proud to be part of the Canadian force, and I, was, and I pr served proudly with many of the people whom I knew uh, and, and met during that time are, are serving us overseas in, in, in various theaters. So I think that um, when I was when I joined, uh, there was a lot of women actually that were in the in the reserves at the time. So that was interesting for one thing, but they uh, but they. I never really had the luxury of having any female mentors, you know, which is interesting because nowadays, you know, everything we talk about, International Women's Day, you know, you need fem women need to empower each other and you have to take care of each other. I never had that because I think that I, uh, I just, they were just weren't around in the, in the different areas that I was in. So a lot of my mentors were men and, um, and, and they were fantastic and I was fortunately treated well, not always. Um, I find that I use my voice a lot. Probably it gets me into a lot of trouble, but I, uh, I, I did it for the better, sometimes for the worse. But uh, I've just never been afraid to say what's on my mind, and that goes a long way. You have to be informed, though. You have to know what you're talking about, know what you're doing. You don't just go off half-cocked and say stuff. You have to be informed and understand what's going on around you. So I just, I did that. I want to say on behalf of Ryerson, I want to thank Adrian and Stephen for coming.